The scripture reading today is taken from Hebrews chapter thirteen, one to eight, and fifteen to sixteen. Listen to the word of God. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some have done this. Have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison, as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated, as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Give honor to marriage, and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral. And those who commit adultery, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have, for God has said, "I will never fail you; I will never abandon you." So we can say with confidence, "The Lord is my helper; so I will have no fear." What can mere people do to me? Remember your leaders who taught you. The word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives, and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to His name, and don't forget to do good. And to share with those in need, these are the sacrifices that please God. Amen. The grace and peace of Christ be with all of us today. A few years ago, a church elder angrily asked me why the church always has to talk about love. He was sick and tired of hearing pastors talk on this topic. Tired of hearing sermons on love. Tired of all of our church hymns going on and on about love. He told me he wanted to find a nice church where the pastor and people there weren't so interested in love. It was one of the few times in my faith life that I was just shocked, speechless. It was as if this guy was suddenly talking to me in a language, a strange language, so completely different from anything that I knew. So different from the language of Christian faith, so completely different from the logic of faith. I had no idea how to even start to communicate with him. Love is the very marker of our Christian faith. It's what makes us Christian. It would be like complaining about people always talking about God in church. That's what we do here. That's why we're here. Love is also what we do here. It's why we're here. Jesus directly commands us to love, to love God and to love one another, to love God by loving one another. In John thirteen thirty four to thirty five, Jesus tells us directly, "A new commandment I give to you: love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. In this way." In this way, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So, love is not just the central command of our Christian faith; it's what defines us as Christians. If you don't let love guide your actions, if you don't let love guide your behavior, your ethics, your thinking, it's really hard then to be following Christ. The second time in my life, in my church life, that I was shocked speechless came a few years later. I was sitting in a church meeting when suddenly a young pastor angrily said that God never wanted us to love others. And again, that was just so bizarre. And again, I had this feeling almost like culture shock, not really knowing what to do in this situation. I couldn't understand at all how someone could. Come to faith, devote their life to the church, go through seminary, become a pastor, and yet seemingly never read the Bible. 
or seemingly never understand the very first building block and foundation of our faith, which is Christ's core core command for us to love. But sadly, I think this attitude is spreading. In recent years, there have been more and more attempts to do something that should really be impossible, to disconnect our Christian faith from Christ's central command for us to love. All of us know that following Christ and loving others, that's really one and the same thing. All of us know that love is what defines us as Christians. But sadly, I think some small groups are trying to change that, trying to change Christ's own definition of who his followers should be, and instead wanting to use Christ's name not to love, but to offend, to hurt, to even hate others. There are some who hate others and then defend this hate by saying, well, that's just part of their Christian faith, an expression of their religious freedom, an expression of their religious belief. Some who want to offend and reject, some who want to destroy and hate and kill others, think that they can do that in Christ's name. I don't think that works. Again, this really should be impossible. Jesus says, in this way, in this way, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I don't think hating should ever be a part of our faith life. Over the last few Sundays, we've been reading through the letter to the Hebrews, a letter written to a young community of Christian converts who had come from a Jewish background. As new Christians, there was still so much for them to learn, so much about faith for them to learn, so much about following Jesus that they still had to know, so much for the writer of this letter to tell them. And after this whole long letter, these 13 chapters, at the very end of this letter, in this final chapter that we read today, the writer focuses everything on this one final point. If they've heard nothing else, if they've understood nothing else that he's said or written to them, at least hold on to this one essential, indispensable truth. That to be a Christian means to keep on loving each other. This last word, this final command is also the first word. This is the absolute core, the foundation of our faith. And the writer repeats it in verse 1. Keep on loving each other. Despite everything else that may happen, despite all of the challenges and arguments and troubles that swirl around us in this world, hold on still to this rock. Hold on to this one central command. Keep on loving each other. It sounds like a simple command, but since the whole world also talks a lot about love and often means something very different by it, This command to us to love can leave us sometimes a little bit confused. Unlike other ideas of love, Christian love is not supposed to just be a feeling or an emotion. Instead, Christian love, in the model of Christ, is an action that always aims at achieving what's best for those around us. It's something we do for other people's benefit. And Christian love especially focuses on helping and caring for those who are most in need. Being an active and positive influence in other people's lives in the same way that Christ has been a positive influence in our lives too. And so here in this final chapter, the writer begins in verse 1 by repeating this core command of our faith to keep on loving each other. And then he spends the rest of the chapter giving us practical examples of what that type of active, uplifting, positive love looks like. The writer describes five different aspects of Christian love, and we want to look at them quickly this morning. The first point that the writer mentions is hospitality, welcoming and caring for others. I don't think it's a surprise that hospitality comes very first on this list. 
Because there's probably no greater marker of our faith than this ancient demand to be hospitable. It's already rooted there in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament scriptures and in the divine laws, we have this command to be hospitable. God demands it. God demands that his people always care for the stranger and the foreigner. God demands that we refuse to abuse them and take advantage of them. God demands that we support them as they come to live among us, that we welcome them, we make space for them, we welcome them to be integrated parts of our communities. There are too many biblical examples for us to mention this morning or for us to go through. But in Exodus 22, 21, just after the Ten Commandments, that's where we see one of the most famous examples. As the voice of God booms out the law to Moses from on Mount Sinai, God commands the Israelites saying, You shall not mistreat or oppress foreigners in any way. Remember, you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. In the Old Testament, it was this understanding of the absolute importance of hospitality that drove Abraham and Sarah to invite in and feed unknown wandering strangers, strangers who turned out to be angels of God himself. It was in this same spirit of hospitality that Lot invited wandering strangers into his own home to feed them, to care for them, to protect them from the violence of those local townspeople. Again, strange guests who turned out to be angels of the living God. It was this spirit of hospitality that led Mary and Martha, Simon Peter and his wife, and countless others to open their doors in welcome to Jesus. Greeting, feeding, caring, this time not for angels, but for God himself. The story of our faith is the story of the importance of hospitality, of knowing the needs that others have and being willing to open our arms and welcome others. The writer of Hebrews probably had all of those biblical examples in mind when he stressed in verse 2 that by opening our doors and welcoming strangers and foreigners, some have welcomed angels without realizing it. But even though that's true, Sadly, that means the opposite is also true. When we refuse to be hospitable, we close our doors not only on angels, we close our doors on, also on God himself. We see the saddest example of this in the Christmas story. On that first Christmas, no one opened their doors or welcomed the Holy Family. No one gave them room. No one cared for them. Instead, people shut them out, refused to greet them or accept them, and in so doing, they very, very literally shut the door on God himself. In Christ, God himself comes as a stranger into our world. As a stranger, he finds no welcome here. That's why there's probably no greater act of Christian love that we can show in our nations today, in our communities today, than this act of hospitality. To welcome the alien and the stranger. To welcome our Indonesian and Filipino workers. To welcome the migrant and the refugee. To use our laws to protect them instead of hurting and abusing them. To welcome and integrate them into our communities. The Bible sees this as not negotiable, as something we must do. The writer of Hebrews encourages us in a positive way to think of the wonderful possibility of opening our hearts, our homes, and our cities to angels in disguise. But in Matthew 25, Christ Jesus himself makes the alternative plainly clear. He says, when we close our doors to the alien, the foreigner, the refugee, we are closing our doors and rejecting Christ himself. We can't claim to be Christian on the one hand. We can't claim to love and follow Christ on the one hand and then refuse hospitality on the other. That's one reason why I'm really incredibly proud of our EM community here. We constantly receive, we constantly get such touching feedback from people who have found love 
welcome and hospitality here. Despite coming from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different faiths, different lifestyles. In our church community, people have found welcome. People have found attention and care. They have found a community here where they feel at home. I think that's a really wonderful thing in our community, and it's something I really look forward to, to watching grow in the future as well. The second aspect, the second aspect of Christian love that Hebrews mentions in today's reading is empathy. In verse 3, the writer commands us to remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember those being mistre mistreated as if you felt that pain in your own body. And that's really what empathy is all about. It's about placing ourselves into someone else's situation. Empathy is about being able to understand what other people are going through, to feel the pain that they're facing, to know the despair that they're going through. And that's really important for us to practice. That's really important for us to do. Our Creator God made us all. God made all people. God made us all to be the same, to be human, to be brothers and sisters in the same family. So one of the most damaging sins that we can commit is to tell ourselves that others are actually different from us. We watch the way that other families suffer and we tell ourselves that, well, that's okay because we think that they don't love their children as much as we love ours. We see the struggles and oppression that others face and we tell ourselves that, well, the suffering of other people, the suffering of poor people, of foreigners, indigenous people, that's somehow different from the suffering and the pain that we go through. We tell ourselves that our lives are just too different. But empathy goes against that. Empathy is the aspect of love that reminds us that we are all sisters and brothers in this world. We are all God's children. No matter what our race or religion or background or bank balance or immigration status may be, sufferings and mistreatments, they all hurt us the same. On a personal note, for me as an Australian, it's been a deep disappointment over the last few years to hear some of our Australian politicians actually argue against empathy, demanding that people reject empathy, reject this common bond of love that we have with each other, to purposefully stop feeling for others, to stop feeling for the sufferings that other people are going through, and to say all the while that this is an okay position to take for a Christian or a Christian community. God's Word really shows us that this is the wrong way to go. It's the wrong way to go. In the same way that Christ came and shared our sufferings with us, Christ also demands that we share in other people's sufferings too. We can't really do well as Christians if we reject this command of Christ to treat others with empathy. Instead, Christ demands that we really do take ourselves and put ourselves into our neighbor's position, that we feel the same mistreatments that they're feeling, and that we bravely work to put an end to that suffering. The third aspect, the third aspect of love that today's scripture mentions is faithfulness. In verse 4, the particular example of faithfulness that the author points to is the faithfulness that we need in a marriage relationship. And I don't think that's a surprise since one of the most important relationships we'll ever have in life is that relationship with our partner. When two people grow together, they open themselves up to one another. They let down their defenses, they trust one another, and not only share their life, but they share their hearts, their emotions, their dreams together. Here in the church, when we do pre-marriage counseling, I always remind couples that that first moment of being naked in front of their partner is incredibly, well, can be incredibly difficult, even embarrassing. That's because we spend our lives putting up walls between us. We spend, up, we spend our lives putting up walls, distancing ourselves from other people, hiding and protecting our true self. 
And that means then that first time to be naked in front of someone involves a lot of bravery, involves incredible trust. Trust that that other person is not going to hurt us. But that bodily nakedness is just the first step. That's just the first step because beneath the skin, we still hold so many walls and barriers in place. Beneath the skin, we're still hiding our true selves, our true feelings. We still protect that deep center of our hearts behind so many invisible walls and barriers. And it can take some couples years to truly open themselves up to one another, to share their true heart with one another, to share their true self. It takes time because this closeness, this openness to one another, leaves us feeling so vulnerable in love. And past hurts have made us a bit wary. Past hurts in love have made it hard for us to be so trusting. That's why as Christians in our relationships, we promise never to take advantage of that vulnerability. We promise never to use it to hurt our partners. We promise to stand by one another. We promise to support one another, to be loyal and faithful to the ones we love. It's because of that mutual openness, because of that mutual vulnerability, that cheating is so destructive in a relationship. It's why it hurts us so deeply. And so the writer to the Hebrews reminds us that this behavior, this kind of unfaithfulness, is inappropriate in Christian relationships. But while the writer here talks about the importance of faithfulness and trustworthiness in a marriage relationship, I think those principles are important in all of our relationships. In our normal friendships, it's also not right for us to abuse one another, to abuse people's trust. And this is especially important for those of us in business. For those of you who struggle through the business world, struggle through business relationships, you know how much trust and faithfulness can mean. Business is all about faithfulness and trust. We need to know whether we can trust business partners to stay true to their word, whether we can trust suppliers to provide what they promise, whether bosses and employees can trust one another to be working for each other's best interests, whether we can trust a client to call us back or mail that check like they promised they would. As Christians, we want to live lives of faithfulness. We want to live lives of trust and dependability, not just in our marriage or in our romantic relationships, but in all of our encounters with others. Because we carry the name of Christ, we want all people to know. We want all people to know us as being honest and trustworthy people, working for what's right and good, rather than just being people who would take advantage of others for our own gain. This leads us to the fourth point. Generosity. Generosity. Verse 5 in today's reading encourages us not to love money. But what's important is the reason behind that, the reason why. I think very few of us really love money. Instead, we spend so much time making money because we simply just want to survive. We need money to protect our families. We need money to live. We need money to give us a place to stay. We need money to be able to buy food, to provide health care, education, clothes for our families. We worry, very rightly, about providing for ourselves, providing for our families, and what we would do if we didn't have money. But it's that worry that quickly becomes harmful. That's why the writer immediately reminds us of God's promises to us. God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. It's this fear that's the problem. It's this fear, this fear for our livelihood, this fear of not being able to provide for the ones that we love. It's that fear that pushes us to be consumed by the search for money every minute. But this is where God encourages us to let go. To let go of our fears, to let go of our worries, and to trust in Him. To trust in Him and His people. 
Because if we can trust in God, if we can let go of that fear, if we can really know that God is always here for us and will care for us and will never abandon us, then we finally get set free from that fear and worry and we get set free to be generous to others. We saw that in the early church. In the book of Acts, we saw in those early chapters of Acts the way that Christian believers lived together, sharing their resources, caring for those in need, and being generous. Knowing that when there was a need, that they could let go of greed and share with those around them. Knowing that God's resources would be enough for all of them. For that reason, in the Christian life, generosity also became a great sign of the depth of our faith. When we trust that God is caring for us, we no longer need to grab so tightly to every cent. Instead, trust in God sets us free to be generous to those around us. The fifth and the last aspect of Christian love that today's text mentions is encouragement. Back in my student days, a teacher asked me who my heroes were. And in my young way, I just thought, what a bizarre question that is. I'm part of Generation X, and we Gen Xers grew up on, oh, we, we gave up on the whole idea of heroes. We didn't, uh, we didn't really hold on to this idea of having heroes anymore. I don't actually see that as something so negative either. We simply don't fall into this trap of idolizing people of putting them up on pedestals where they will eventually let us down. We know that no earthly person can ever live up to our expectations. No earthly person can ever be absolutely perfect, be an absolute perfect role model for us. After all, each one of us is imperfect in our own ways. But having that understanding, understanding that, that doesn't mean that we can't still admire people. Instead, we should admire others for what they do really achieve, despite their problems, despite being imperfect. Part of our human spirit is this way. Part of our human spirit is to strive to do our best, despite being broken in so many ways. And that's something we really can admire in others. And that's something we want to encourage in each other. It's the same in our faith lives. There is no Christian sister or brother who is not touched by sin. There is no Christian sister or brother who is not imperfect in many different ways. To be a sinner is to miss the mark. And we all miss it, each one of us. As Romans 3, 10 to 12 reminds us, no one is worthy. No one is righteous. No, not one. We have all fallen away. But importantly, the important point here is that we don't use that as a reason to then be cynical and give up on love or to give up on encouragement. We shouldn't use that as a reason to constantly just then find fault with each other. Instead, that should be a reason for us to keep on encouraging one another, supporting one another, lifting one another up and celebrating the great acts of love and faith that we do achieve. The church and, well, really the whole world, is a bit like the Paralympics. All of us come with our own disabilities and weaknesses. All of us come held back in some way by the sin and failings in our lives. And yet, and yet with grace and strength and perseverance, even these imperfect, broken and sinful lives of ours can still achieve incredible things, wonderful things. We can still spread love. And that in itself is a great victory. These are achievements that we should celebrate. They're a reason for us to keep on encouraging one another. Verse 7 in today's text says, Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. But I don't think we should limit it in that way. We shouldn't limit this attitude just to leaders. We should expand this to all of our sisters and brothers here. All of us, all of us have our failings and our weaknesses. None of us can ever be perfect examples or perfect role models of faith. 
But even though each of us is imperfect and fallen in some way, how amazing it is that we can still grow this love. We can still work for goodness. How wonderful it is that in our actions we can still help each other, love each other. That's really an incredible effort. That's really an incredible achievement that we want to hold up. We want to admire. We want to take that on as a model for ourselves wherever we can find it. And that's why we as loving Christians especially want to be people who will always continue to encourage one another. To encourage one another to keep on running that race, to keep on striving to reach that goal of love. Love in all its dimensions is so central, so vital for our Christian lives. We simply can't live a Christian life without love. It's important for us to hold on to this truth because sometimes I fear that the world tries its best to convince us otherwise. Our cities, our societies, our world changes so quickly. And that change makes us uncertain. It makes us nervous. In the middle of that nervousness, the world comes to us and tells us that love is no longer the best option. The world comes to us and tells us that love may have been fine in the good old days. But these days, in this modern world, today's world needs something better. And then the solutions that the world holds out for us, the solutions that the world pushes onto us, things like nationalism, racism, greed, all of those falsely promise to save us. They promise to save us by breaking down love for each other. All around the world we see leaders fighting against the principles of hospitality, rejecting empathy, laughing at the idea of faithfulness and trust, rejecting the way of generosity and promoting fear instead of encouragement. They lie to us and tell us that a life of selfishness, a life of greed, a life of hostility is the best way forward. But I know that none of us will be fooled by that. Evil always tries to convince us that the time for love is past. The time for love is gone. But we hold on to this faith, this faith in love. We hold on to the values that Christ has taught us. And we know that that will never change. Christ's teachings on love, Christ's focus on love, his demand for love are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. There will never be a time in history when love is not appropriate. There will never be a time when love is not the answer. As verse 8 tells us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is love. Christ is love. And so to stand against love is always, eternally, to stand against the rule of Christ. We cannot be Christians and not love. So how should we live? How then should we live? What's the best way for us to go about our lives? What is it that we should expect from ourselves? What is it that we should expect from our politicians, from our nations? The answer at the very end brings us full circle back to the very beginning. Back to that core of our faith. That core of divine reality itself. What is it that we should do? Verse 16 tells us simply and plainly, do good, share with those in need. That's what pleases God. We need to stand strong. We need to stay true to love. We need to hold on to it as the principle that guides our life. We need to stand strong and hold on to the principles of hospitality and empathy, faithfulness, generosity and encouragement. We need to expect these principles of ourselves. We need to demand them from the world around us too. Because only in this way, by staying strong in our demand for goodness and love, will we see our lives and our world truly become changed. Let's pray together. Lord Christ, you tell us to keep loving each other as brothers and sisters. 
This command isn't hard to understand, but there are so many temptations that pull us away from that love. Help us to be strong. Remind us that you are love. Strengthen us to never give up on you or your way. Through our hospitality and empathy, through our faithfulness, through our generosity and mutual encouragement, turn us into lights of love that will always burn bright for you in this world and refuse to be put out. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh,